Hello, I'm Phil Marlon, and I thought it might be helpful to some people uh, for me to record this uh, little video on ADHD, Attention Deficit Hyperactivity Disorder. It's based on a, a book I wrote that was published in 2015 called The Disintegrating Self, Psychotherapy with Adult ADHD and Autistic Spectrum. Uh, now, part of the reason I wanted to uh, put this little video out there is because uh, there is a lot of uh, misunderstanding, really, about the nature of ADHD. Uh, the, the name itself is misleading because the, the first word is attention, which makes it sound as though that's the key feature that it's something to do with a problem of attention. And although certainly problems in attending and in sustaining attention uh, can be a feature, it's, it's just one little component of a much uh, deeper and uh, broader uh, syndrome. And in its essence, uh, it's to do with a deficit in the brain's regulation of itself, in the brain's regulation of emotion, of mood, of impulse, and motivation. And uh, I'll, I'll try to explain a little bit more uh, what that's all about. Uh, so I'm going to um, uh, put some PowerPoint slides up and uh, we'll go through it. Okay, we'll just let that, um, yeah, there we go. Okay, so uh, first of all, uh, here's a note to uh, any psychotherapists or psychologists who may be watching this, uh, why I've wanted to convey this information. And it's really because Many psychotherapists have clients or patients with ADHD or autistic spectrum conditions, and the two are somewhat related, without realizing that this is the case. And so they, they don't really get, these people don't get good help. They don't get good understanding. Or if you like, there is a misunderstanding of, um, of the person's uh, difficulties. ADHD and also autistic spectrum are vivid examples of the interplay of the neurobiological and the psychological and how both perspectives are needed for a more complete understanding. Each informs the other. So we start with a neurobiological impairment which then interacts with the family, the school, and the social environment to create the problems that the adult later presents as ADHD. And there are multiple psychological traumas arising from this uh, interaction between temperament and the environment with profound impacts on self-esteem, self-image, and uh, confidence. People with ADHD and also autistic spectrum traits have a vulnerability to panic, anxiety states, depression, and also personality disorders. So it can create a lot of uh, misery, really. So people often experience many difficulties in life uh, without realizing uh, it's to do with ADHD. So, for example, uh, people may know they cannot manage many ordinary aspects of life. They know they tend to be disorganized, forgetful, late, and erratic. They know they get bored easily and find this very aversive. They know they can be impulsive. They know they can get into fights and arguments. 
They know they often experience life as tedious, painful, frustrating and unrewarding and feel restless. They know they can feel depressed and anxious, but they do not know they have ADHD. And people can, can seek help uh, from doctors, psychiatrists, psychotherapists or other mental health professionals and they don't always get the understanding they need. And this just leaves them feeling more battered and wounded deeply in their self-esteem. Now, here are nine symptoms that most strongly differentiate people with ADHD. Making decisions impulsively. Difficulty stopping activities when they should do. Starting a project or a task without reading or listening to directions carefully. Showing poor follow through on promises or commitments made to others. Having trouble doing things in the proper order or sequence. Driving with excessive speed. Being prone to daydreaming when they should be concentrating having trouble planning ahead and being quite unable to persist in a task or even begin a task if it's not of immediate interest to the person. Now, it's not a discrete syndrome. It's probably uh, involves, uh, there are many, many variants, many forms uh, and variants. And also there's much overlap and comorbidity with other conditions. But I think it is a useful uh, core construct that's helpful in um, understanding uh, certain common constellations of impaired attention, organization, and uh, impulse and, and mood uh, regulation. Now, it's, uh, research has shown that um, uh, ADHD is associated with many other uh, mental health difficulties. Um, OCD, um, interpersonal sensitivity, depression, hostility, anxiety, uh, phobic uh, problems, paranoia, or e even elements of uh, psychoticism. And the research has shown that 80% of ADHD groups showed at least one other disorder. Uh, so it's strongly linked with um, depression, uh, dysthymia, general uh, mood of, of lack of pleasure in life. Uh, uh, oppositional uh, disorders. Uh, conduct disorders, also alcohol and drug uh, use, misuse. I think it can be a hidden core in other conditions. Um, if we think about uh, the kind of people um, referred for anger management or for who have challenging and chaotic presentations to mental health services, People uh, who attract a diagnosis of emotionally unstable personality disorder or antisocial personality disorder. Certain OCD obsessive compulsive disorder presentations, addictive personalities, people who are sensation or drama seeking, anxiety states with a racing mind. These all have qualities of uh, ADHD uh, in them. And mood instability, difficulties in regulating mood uh, may be a very uh, key feature. And uh, there we have links with uh, other mental health conditions, including uh, bipolar disorder and uh, so-called borderline personality disorder. Um, people with um, adult ADHD have, have been shown to, to have a 6.2 6 times increased risk for uh, bipolar disorder. 
uh, and, um, uh, and also uh, strong links with um, uh, personality disorders uh, such as uh, borderline personality. Um, uh, this slide again, borderline personality. Um, uh, a high a high correlation with uh, ADHD. Now, one of the features of uh, people with ADHD, and, and it's it's very important to understand this, is that they have an enhanced need for the uh, regulatory presence of other people. Now, um, we we all need this, and it's most. Um, strongly apparent, it's most obvious in children, that uh, the child requires the, uh, the presence of the caregiver, people looking after the child, people um, closely connected to the child, the child's attachment figures, to be there uh, continually assisting the child in the regulation of their own inner state. So it's not just helping to regulate the child's um, uh, internal physiology in terms of providing uh, nutrition and uh, warmth and protection and all of that kind of thing, but also all of the uh, emotional support, the emotional regulation, the soothing, uh, the stimulation, uh, the help in thinking, uh, the help in uh, managing uh, distress, the help in um, uh, planning. Uh, the, the, the caregivers um, assist the child's own mental and physiological functioning. They, they assist the child's brain. Um, uh, the, the, we, the, with the child, we, we form a, um, um, I can't think of the, 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 the word, the, but we, we form a, a, a partnership uh, to regulate the, uh, the, child's, um, the child's state of being. Uh, now, uh, the psychoanalyst uh, Heinz Kohut, uh, uh, who, who's been very influential on my, uh, uh, my own understanding and perspectives, um, he had the concept of the self-object. It's written as one word. And uh, what he meant was that the, the self and the other uh, form one uh, system. So the other becomes part of the, uh, of, of the child's uh, self at a, at a functional level. It's not a, a fusion of identities, but at the, uh, at, the, at the functional level, the child's brain and the, uh, the, the caregiver's uh, close attention form one regulatory uh, uh, system, Cohort's concept of the, of the self-object. Now, we never fully outgrow the need for others to help us regulate our, uh, our inner states. We are uh, social beings, we are attachment beings. Uh, but uh, we, we are, as we uh, grow up and grow older, we acquire a little bit more uh, inner capacity to regulate our own, um, our own inner, inner states. Uh, now, the point I'm getting to is that people with ADHD have an enhanced need for this uh, self-object uh, regulatory uh, presence, input from other people. They, they need it more than uh, some other people. That's um, a, a, key, uh, a key feature of, of this. And uh, the person can become very uh, disturbed, um, uh, distressed, um, um, in panic, uh, disintegrating, uh, disintegrating, uh, hence the title of my book, The Disintegrating Self, when that regulatory presence of the other is not, uh, is not available. Oh, what's happened to my slides here? 
find my place again. Um, now, another way that these things are very commonly uh, uh, misunderstood, um, and I, I worked for uh, 37 years uh, in the NHS, and I often came across this uh, kind of issue that if a child with ADHD is seen in a family context as a common and understandable, but nevertheless misguided tendency, people who do not really understand ADHD, professional people who do not really understand it, to view the problem as arising from inadequate boundary setting and structure. So they think this, this child is out of control because uh, the parents are not setting appropriate boundaries and limits and, and, and so on. So the, the, the problem is seen, misperceived, as an expression of family dynamics, uh, when actually it, it's a little bit more the other way, that the family dynamics are an expression of the, the, um, uh, the child's ADHD. Of course, it's, it's an interaction, so each plays against the, the other, but it's, I think it's very important to understand the, the fundamental bedrock of neurobiology that is then playing into all these um, wider interpersonal and family uh, dynamics. And this misunderstanding can greatly add to the family's despair and uh, feelings of guilt. So uh, within both ADHD and the associated autistic spectrums, uh, people may feel in continual danger of this state of disintegration when the whole, the whole state of being is in danger of falling apart sense of disintegration. They, they need the organizing and stimulating and regulating empathic responsiveness of other people. And when this is absent, uh, the mental world is felt to be falling apart. The, the person feels unable to think or plan or focus or have any motivation for anything. Uh, this can also uh, result in states of rage that can often be turned on the self or sometimes turned on others. And also it can trigger an addictive searching for stimulation, uh, for, for drama, searching out drama and conflict um, uh, to, to stimulate the brain. And the shame is always there, potentially overwhelming. It's a, a constant uh, threat. Uh, whether our autistic spectrum uh, traits as well, the result of all of this may be a, a turning away from others and seeking comfort and security in inanimate objects or repetitive uh, activities. Another way of thinking about this is in uh, classical um, Freudian terms, uh, uh, Sigmund Freud's uh, model of the mind, where the ego and the ego functions are to do with uh, regulating the inner world in its interaction with the outer world. The ego being like the, the managerial function between the inner and the outer, between the inner world, the inner needs, and the external reality and the reality of uh, other people. So uh, there can be these pervasively impaired ego functions of difficulties with impulse control, difficulties in tolerating frustration and delay, difficulties in forward planning, difficulties generally in acceptance of reality. Now, it's not a benign disorder. At all. They, uh, for those it afflicts, particularly when it's severe, it can cause devastating problems. So studies have shown people with AD, ADHD are more likely to drop out of school, not complete uh, further education. They may have few or no friends. They may engage in antisocial activities. 
there may be teenage pregnancy, they may experience depression, they may develop personality disorders, uh, they may use illicit drugs, drive too fast, uh, may have multiple car accidents. Now, it does have some similarities, uh, ADHD, with uh, autistic spectrum Asperger type features. Um, and uh, there's a list there on the screen. I am, I'm not going to go through uh, all of them, but um, uh, children with both ADHD um, and children with autistic spectrum features may show um, the following um, um, uh, features. And they may be very intelligent. Um, uh, both groups may experience uh, a lot of anxiety. It's, it's this threat of disintegration. So here are three ways of succinctly describing ADHD, and they're, they're really all saying the same thing, but from slightly different perspectives. So at the neurobiological level, ADHD is a range of atypical features in the circuitry affecting the frontal lobe. There are many parts of the brain that can be involved in ADHD, but uh, uh, a deficit in the frontal lobes, the executive functioning, uh, is considered to be um, quite key to all of this. At the psychological level, ADHD is a range of conditions of enhanced need for self-object responsiveness from others to assist in the management of arousal, mood, impulse, and the relationship with the external world. Within a classic Freudian psychoanalytic framework, ADHD reflects a weak ego and comprises a general and pervasive deficit in ego functions. Uh, it is highly heritable, twin studies uh, indicating that. Other factors can be involved, um, in, including uh, uh, trauma, um, uh, physical trauma and um, emotional trauma. These can also play uh, some part. So the ADHD mind tends towards chaos. It lacks coherence and order. Perceptual experiences may be abnormal. They may, may be less coherent than the person's perceptual world may be captured by a particular element or detail, lacking a normal uh, organizing gestalt. Uh, emotions and impulses may intrude into the person's consciousness without the person understanding them. They may panic if the patterns of life are not as expected, resulting in a sense of chaos. Because uh, the, the internal chaos means that there's a greater need for order and predictability in the external world. And when both internal and, and external are chaotic, there is that sense of uh, disintegration. And also uh, the flooding of emotion from within will escalate that sense of, of chaos, resulting in, in mounting panic and, and rage. So the person can feel quite helpless, um, powered like a motor, compulsively driven, a hyperactive brain state, a proliferation of thoughts and anxieties and impulses with little capacity to exert control over these. Uh, social perceptions may be askew because of a, a failure to grasp the overall social context of a situation. And as a result of all of these things, the person with ADHD may experience a continual sense of failure. They may be 
continually struggling to compensate for that uh, that that weight of repeated repeated uh, experiences of failure, some tiny and some uh, major. So the person with ADHD can be pervaded by self-doubt, lack of confidence. And these can coexist with apparent bravado or grandiosity. The person may feel quite realistically that they cannot trust their own mind to function reliably. The tasks are often left undone, uh, partly because of there's an impaired motivation in, in ADHD if the activity provides no immediate reward. Partly things are left undone because they're simply forgotten, if not a priority in the person's mind. And then this leads to further avoidance of the task because thinking about the failure to do it evokes anxiety and guilt. And so the whole thing uh, escalates in a horrible way. Um, okay, and I've already covered that uh, the points on this slide. Um, uh, psychotherapists uh, with a psychoanalytic background may be interested to consider uh, Wilfred Bion's notion of uh, beta elements in the mind. These are the raw sensory emotional data that are in themselves unsuitable for thinking until they are transformed by what he called alpha function, which transforms them into um, suitable material for thinking and dreams. But the, uh, the ADHD mind, I think, experiences a proliferation of these beta elements. So the person feels persecuted by these raw beta elements in the mind and may feel terrified by long dreams of being uh, hunted or uh, pursued. Uh, and uh, feels a, a desperate need to to expel something, but they don't do quite. They don't know what it is. They don't have a way of uh, making any sense of what it is. They are continually uh, persecuted by uh, within these beta elements. So in the family situation, you get these malignant escalations. A child who's prone to rage or seemingly strong-willed, who doesn't respond normally to typical sanctions and socialization, uh, becomes more enraged when thwarted um, and uh, maybe seems to seek out confrontations. Uh, perhaps it's hyperactive, doesn't sleep, perhaps wants everything they see. Um, the parents don't understand why the child is naughty and criticized by parents. Parents are exhausted, frustrated, angry, despairing, guilty. Parental criticism evokes more rage in the child whose self-esteem is plummeting relentlessly. Um, uh, parents feel helpless um, and they're chronic adaptation to the situation is misperceived by others as the cause of the problem and everyone's in despair. Now here's a, uh, another paradoxical and um, awful uh, feature of ADHD. So it's been found that when children with uh, attention deficit disorder, children and, and teenagers performed a concentration task, there was an increased amount of slow brain activity in the frontal lobes instead of, of the normal increase in faster brain brainwave activity. Uh, so it's like the more effort the person puts into the task, the less they're able to focus. The more effort, the less efficient the brain becomes. So that's a very difficult um, 
phenomenon to um, to cope with. Um, also, not enough dopamine. I'll come come on to that later. So uh, there can be this unconscious, addictive, brain-driven attempts to boost adrenaline and to stimulate the the underfunctioning frontal lobes, and so the person is driven to uh, pick arguments, uh, create drama, fights, create emotional scenes, and to be oppositional, and to be to have very negative thoughts thinking the worst, because um, negative thoughts, catastrophizing, um, and, a, and in a sense, complaining, these are all actually more stimulating to the brain. Uh, neutral or positive thoughts uh, are, are calming, calm the brain, when Actually, what the person's brain is seeking is uh, stimulation. Um, now, basically, commonly, there's not enough dopamine or not enough dopamine in the right areas, not enough dopamine uh, getting to where it should be or doing what it should be. And this results in uh, a combination of uh, a lack of motivation and a lack of reward, a lack of, lack of reward, of pleasure in, uh, in activities. Uh, so uh, the, the person feels unmotivated and doesn't experience pleasure and, re and reward in engaging in uh, activity. Uh, so the person is, is driven without awareness of uh, to activities that may stimulate uh, dopamine. So that there is this uh, potential for addiction. Um, uh, addictive activities as a means of regulating emotion and the chaotic mind and providing uh, stimulation and pleasure and reward, which is, uh, there's a deficit in pleasure and reward. Now, fortunately, there are some benefits of ADHD. Creativity. Uh, because the, the, out of the chaos uh, can come creativity, new connections. Um, and the impulsiveness can also lead to novel solutions and um, uh, make the person a little bit more free from uh, usual protocols and accepted uh, procedures. So the person can be adventurous, not inhibited by convention, less restricted by uh, social expectations, even though the person may experience considerable social anxiety. And uh, here's an important point. The person may be capable of hyperfocus, uh, an unusual intensity and persistence of activity uh, when that activity is of interest. So although there can be a general uh, uh, problem in uh, sustaining attention uh, to, to anything that is not strongly of interest, when the person is focused on something of interest, they will hyper-focus and will keep, keep at it for um, an immense amount of time. Uh, slow brain waves may actually facilitate, being, being rather dreamy, it can facilitate uh, creativity and access to uh, the unconscious mind. Uh, Tom Hartman uh, presented this um, uh, uh, pharma theory that um, ADHD characteristics may have been of value in early nomadic conditions uh, where it would facilitate searching and seeking, taking risks and uh, engaging in uh, competition. Um, the gift of the hunter child, he, he called it. Um, 
some other writers uh, uh, summarized uh, the advantages in this way. Uh, Blum and colleagues, Blum, uh, psychoanalyst. We wish to emphasize there are many examples in which the restless workaholic always have to be doing something. I need to be my own boss. Characteristics of ADHD subjects result in very successful lives. Thus, in the right combination, some of the symptoms we have been discussing in a negative light can be used to great advantage. So some of the most accomplished uh, creative people, uh, people, uh, business entrepreneurs, uh, uh, sometimes um, uh, scientists, um, uh, some uh, politicians and, and uh, leaders, uh, rock musicians, um, many of these uh, people who, who've uh, accomplished a great deal in life, um, they clearly show uh, many symptoms of uh, ADHD. Now, this is important, the default mode network. This is, uh, an, uh, these are regions of the brain that take over when we're not focused on something external. And uh, they assist in um, internal reverie, free association, reviewing experiences and events, uh, thinking through things in our own mind, can facilitate dreamy sorts of states. Now, what should happen is that that default mode network shuts down when we focus on something external. But uh, with people with ADHD, it may not. It doesn't shut down. And so the person is trying to focus on something external, but they've got this dreamy thing going on uh, in, inside. And that can disrupt many tasks involving attention and uh, focus. Um, now, a little bit more about um, uh, uh, brain hormones, brain amines here. So we need adrenaline to power up the brain. There's often a, uh, a, a deficiency in, in that, in norepinephrine that's needed to power up the brain, to wake the brain up. Because in, in many ways, the ADHD brain is a sort of dozy brain. It's not fully awake. And then we need dopamine to keep it focused on track. And we need serotonin to regulate mood. Now, all of that is a simplification of complex processes, but um, it's... Um, uh, there's, there's something in those those three key points there. So what can the neurobiology of ADHD tell us about uh, ADHD? What can it, it explain? Well, uh, what we know of the dysfunctional, the underperforming frontal lobes, that explains the diminished capacities for inhibition uh, and uh, inhibition and regulation of, of affect, of emotion, of mood, uh, of impulse, and impaired executive functioning, planning ahead, thinking ahead, thinking of consequences. Can also explain the impaired uh, so-called theory of mind functioning, uh, the capacity to take account to understand other people's minds. Now, I, I don't think this is always impaired all the time, but uh, when the ADHD person is stressed, uh, their capacity to think about the other person's mind uh, can be impaired. There can be also this preference for immediate reward, again, because the frontal lobe executive functioning is uh, impaired. 
And so there's an, an enhanced need for these empathic regulatory responses from other people to compensate for uh, uh, what's missing um, in the frontal lobes. Uh, the underperforming frontal lobes are linked with slow brain waves, the dreamy state of mind, and this intrusion of the default mode network. We also have the underpowered basal ganglia, the base of the brain, um, resulting in impaired motivation. The brain's not properly awake, and this can lead a person non-consciously to seek conflict, drama, and interpersonal stress, and addiction to uh, negative thoughts. Um, uh, it's not that the, the motivation itself is uh, um, unconscious in the dynamic psychoanalytic sense. It's simply that the person is not conscious and not really able to be conscious of uh, why they are driven uh, in this way. Um, Uh, yeah, uh, much of this, um, this slide here um, I've, I've already uh, spoken about really. Um, I just want to add one thing that the, the depletion in some of the neurotransmitters, the brain amines, uh, this can lead to feeling unloved. Um, and it, it's because of this deficit in reward biochemistry, neurobiochemistry, deficit in the reward at the neurobiological level, deficit in pleasure. This can lead the person to feel unloved because they are attributing their internal state to something external. It's internal, but they attribute, misattribute the cause as something external so that they feel unloved. That can be uh, important. Um, there are also brain dysfunctions that lead to chronic problems with time. People with ADHD often have great problems with time, timing, being on time, uh, predicting how long things will take and so on. Um, as psychotherapists, um, here are three broad areas of helpful intervention. So empathic listening and other provisions of these self-object functions that help to calm, soothe and organize the client's experience, that help to give words to emotions and to states of mind and to enable the person more easily to be in touch with painful or depressive experiences and emotions when these are potentially present. And then we have the ego supportive clarification of life tasks, uh, managing inner needs and desires and ambitions, goals, morals and ideals against the demands and limitations and possibilities of the external world. And this work also includes helping the client consider ways in which his perceptions and recollections of events and situations may be impaired. Now, for colleagues who um, are also energy psychotherapists, that's my area of particular expertise, my passion, energy psychotherapy, uh, there are energy psychology methods to balance and calm and desensitize uh, the mind brain uh, body system and assist in its uh, organization and coherence. And we can also use energy psychology methods to, uh, to alleviate the, uh, the inner impact of um, the repeated traumas that the person will have uh, experienced uh, in their life and facilitate self-acceptance. Um, I just mentioned this as well, that um, 
the child with ADHD um, doesn't really take no for an answer. They don't accept the no and, and use it to build up an internal regulatory uh, agency function in the mind. Instead, they just keep on uh, expelling it. So rather than taking in an external authority and making it part of the structure of their own mind, there's a continual expulsion of all prohibitory intrusions, like a prolonged scream of no. And um, in people with ADHD, there's often a persistence of childhood grandiosity. Now, most children, maybe not actually all children, but most children are uh, uh, originally quite grandiose because they haven't learnt and accepted the limits of their power, what they can achieve. Uh, they haven't learnt to come to terms with uh, reality, limits and loss. Over time, over time and development, there is a gradual coming to terms with reality, limits, loss, pain. But in the case of the ADHD temperament, there is a resistance to this coming to terms with reality. So there's a persistence of uh, grandiosity, egocentricity, uh, narcissism. And this can be very disturbing for the person as, as well as for uh, other people in the person's life, but it, it can be very disturbing and shame evoking for uh, the person struggling with this and it's 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 a difficult um sensitive issue uh, to address and as psychotherapists we need to be extremely uh, tactful so here are what i see as the psychotherapeutic tasks in adhd helping the first person find words and speech for impulse emotion and mood and promote the, uh, I haven't really talked about this, but um, um, the, the, the bringing together of the, the drives of love and the drives of uh, aggression, the fusion of these, um, these fundamental components of our, of, of, our, of, our, of our lives, to bring them together in a, in a, in a fused and um, working together uh, sort of way. Um, there needs to be an exploration of how the person's um, often projection of their own aggression uh, uh, um, onto their perception of the external world, how this colors and distorts their perception of, of others. Uh, we need to assist the person in allowing dominance of the uh, reality principle, the Freudian concept where reality is, is gradually allowed to become the dominating principle, as opposed to the pleasure principle, dominance of the reality principle. Um, strategies of, of uh, sublimation, um, uh, ch channeling activity into uh, useful, productive and creative, um, creative activity that provides um, a higher level of reward. We need to support the function of signal anxiety. What this means is uh, anticipating danger so that the person can learn to have a signal of danger 
uh, rather than experiencing the uh, uh, full catastrophic overwhelm with panic. Um, we need to tactfully counter grandiosity. Uh, we need to explore uh, what we might call the, the, the law, the law in the mind, uh, limits, rules, boundaries. We need to acknowledge and support the positive aspects of ADHD. Um, energy psychology techniques that can be uh, helpful. Um, uh, if you want to know more, you can Google any of these terms, the, uh, the Wayne Cook posture, uh, lung meridian breathing, that's a, a procedure that I uh, developed, uh, collarbone breathing, and the well-known, well-established uh, methods of uh, cross crawl. Um, uh, the the, the um, arms and legs um, uh, crossing, tapping the opposite uh, leg with the, uh, with the with the hand. Uh, all these help to bring about um, uh, uh, calmness, coherence, and a more uh, awake uh, state. There is a key message I think it's important to communicate to the person with ADHD, which is it's not your fault and it's not your parents' fault. It's not anyone's fault. You've struggled all your life with a difficult temperament. Your brain works a little bit differently from those who do not have these problems. And this is why you found life so difficult. There are others like you. And it is possible to understand and alleviate the problem. And to the family uh, with a child with ADHD, uh, I would say coping with a child with ADHD is impossible. It's an impossible task. Whatever you do will be wrong, but the aim is to survive. And that's what your child most needs. And, um, if you're a professional person uh, working with a family where there is ADHD, please do avoid trite platitudes about boundaries and structure. They're likely to have tried those already. Okay, and uh, that again is the, uh, the book I wrote on this, this subject. Um, okay, um, well, to stop um, the slides and uh, thank you very much for listening. I hope it may have been of some interest and value to uh, some. Okay, thank you.